Today I'm going to be finally fixing one of the biggest scrapes I've had with this flat since I got it, which is this useless ancient hob that I absolutely hate. So this is going to be quite a long video, so if people are wanting different types of different parts of it, I'll put the timestamps on the screen, just because I know that if I do a long rambly video like this, people complain because they can't apparently skip through it. So I'll put the times on around the different parts so people can find the parts they're interested in. But yeah, this hob is absolutely horrific. It came with a flat, it's original to the building, so it's probably about 10 years old. And it's just hopeless. It's really slow, you can't control it. It's really hard to clean, like I've tried cleaning it and it just stuff just burns on. The light doesn't work, which is a really nice safety feature because you can't actually tell if it's on until it suddenly gets really hot. So you can easily knock it on by accident and then suddenly, you know, fire because the light doesn't work. The previous owner has managed to scrub all the decals off it, so I've had to label it with a sharpie. It's just really bad. And I've wanted to get a nice new induction hob for quite a while, but I've never had the motivation for it. It's always thought it was too expensive or I don't use it enough. But now, thanks to the coronavirus lockdown, yay, um, I'm, well, trapped inside more, so I'm cooking at home more, so I'm using it more often. And because I'm not, you know, doing things like going outside, travelling and going on nights out, I'm not spending nearly as much money. So I've got some leftover money that I can then use to put towards a new hob. And I may as well do it at the time that I've got that money and when I'm actually going to get the benefit out of the new hob. So let's take a look at what we're going to be putting in. So here we've got the hob I've gone for. And this is a Hisense I6433C, which is one of Hisense's new induction hobs they seem to have introduced to the UK market. It's not a particularly high-end model by any means. Hisense is a fairly budget brand and then this isn't like a super high-end model, but it's decent. And the main thing that I've noticed is, or that I looked for when I bought it, is this is a full power 7.2 kilowatt model. A lot of the cheap induction hobs are really low power and plug into a 13 amp socket. And I didn't want one of those. I wanted one that was full power, that I could have power boost modes on all the rings and all that sort of stuff. So that's why I went for this one. And it should still be a decent brand and it'll hopefully be quite reliable. And I got a really good deal on this. I think I paid £188 from Appliances Direct, which was a sale price. I think everywhere else it was at least £208 and some of those were claiming that was a sale price so this was a pretty good deal and yeah for the features it has it looks really good and the reviews were excellent they got really good re reviews saying that it was responsive it was powerful it worked it was reliable and that's what I was looking for I didn't want it I would have loved to get like a really high-end Bosch or a Neff one or a Siemens or something like that but just I'm not wanting to spend 500 quid on an induction hob that I don't actually use that much this seemed like quite a good option so obviously in this video, as you've seen by the sort of cards I've put up at the start with the times, I'll do a few different stages. I'll be showing the actual installation of this and then I'll be going on to trying it out and reviewing it. So first thing is a disclaimer with the installation is that I'm not an electrician and I'm not, you know, qualified for it. I know, I know all the basics, I know what I'm doing and I know how to do it safely. But don't take my word as gospel, you know, only install something like this yourself if you trust yourself and you know what to do and you know how to check, for example, that your circuit is capable of carrying a hob like this. Because I know all that, I've checked, I know that the circuit can take this hob, I've done the calculations, and I'll go through all that later. But don't attempt this yourself unless you actually know what you're doing, and if in doubt, get someone else to install it for you. But yeah, now let's take a look at installing this. Right, so the first thing I'm going to do is take the oven out. You don't technically need to take it out, especially if there's like drawers underneath, but there's potentially clips on the bottom of the hob that I'll want to maybe get at, and I want to be able to get to the wiring, so I may as well take it out. So let's we'll pull this out. This oven for some reason isn't actually screwed in. It, it never has been, but whatever. We're gonna fix that. There we go, that comes out, and then we can lift that out. And then if I just carefully reach in the back there, get the plug out. There we go. And that can now come out. There we go. So that's the oven now out. Now we just need to remove the hob. So we're going to remove the hob. Of course, the first thing I've also done that I've not said before is I've also disconnected and isolated all the power. So it's both switched off at the isolator here and off at the consumer unit. So we're safe to do all this. So we're now take the hob out. So I've already disconnected all, like removed all the little clips from underneath that were holding it in. So it should just lift out. And all I'll do is lift it and I'll chuck it over onto the side. So in theory, just lift that out, there we go. And then that should come out. There we go. There we go. And I'll flip it upside down so we can access the cables. And I'll put it down here. 
There we go. That is absolutely disgusting under there. Um, obviously there's like just years of grime collected around the edge underneath the lip. And there's this like foam gasket on it here that goes right round. And I think over the years that's like heated up and deteriorated and it's just turned into this like mush where half of it's on the hob, half of it's stuck to the worktop. That's pretty disgusting, it's all over me. I should not have worn a white t-shirt, that was a really stupid idea. Um, but what I'll now do is I'll need to disconnect the wiring and then clean up around the area so we can fit the new hob. So the first thing I'm going to do is disconnect all the wiring from the old hob. This just means I can get it totally out of the way and actually clean because this thing is so manky it's just going to keep producing dirt all over any surface it touches. Like, this is absolutely horrible around here. So, we've got this sort of terminal block thing here. So I'm going to take this screw out. I think this is just a cord grip. I don't think that this actually opens it. That comes out. Oh, that's not a screw, come on. Maybe that just slides back now? Nah, it's not way out. There we go, and then, yep, that looks out of the way. Yep, so that's just a cord grip. That's released the cord, and then there should be a screw in there, I think, but it's missing, so, yep, they've probably nicked that. This flat, there's lots of missing screws and weird issues around. So that should just pop open, there we go. Pop that open, and there is all the terminals. So you can see you've basically got, yep, you've got your live neutral and your earth all connected in there. And interestingly, that earth leaving is totally discoloured. I'm guessing it must just get really hot in here when the hob's running. But yeah, so all you need to do now is remove these three wires, get them out, and get the hob out of the way. And because people on YouTube will never be bang on, yes, I have checked that this is isolated. <laughs> I don't have a death wish. There we go, so that's now removed. We can now just seal this back up, chuck those screws in and then get rid of this hob. Probably take a bit more care if I was actually reusing this thing, but this thing is now going to be going in the bin because it's just so horrible. So, can I get this out of the way? Then we can clean up. So I've now cleaned up around here, it looks looking a bit better, because obviously anything that's trapped around here will get trapped under the new hob. So what I'll now do is I'll take a look at the electrical side of things. So this is my installation here, obviously it varies between different properties. What I've got is I've got a single 32 amp cooker circuit, that comes this outlet plate here, which normally has this um, cover over it. I'm just taking it off to show you. And this outlet plate comes up to this 6mm twin in there that goes to the hob. And then it's 6mm from here back to the consumer unit. Then spurred off of this connection unit here is a socket. This is for the oven. Originally this was a fuse connection unit that was really badly installed. I'll show you a picture. That was original to the flat by the way, so yeah, good job builders who didn't have one with a flex outlet, so did that. But it's only a 13 amp oven, so it can just be put into a plug. So that's what I've done, I've put it into a plug top, which means I can actually unplug it and move the oven totally out of the way. Which makes more sense than having it tethered to the wall and then going into a connection unit and then you couldn't actually move it out to service it. So yeah, that's the oven there. But the important thing with, with induction hobs, or really upgrading any sort of hob, is making sure your circuit and electrical system can handle it. So in this case, the old hob was a 5 kilowatt one, and the new one is 7.2 kilowatt. So you need to really work out what your circuit's capable of. Again, not an electrician, don't take my word as gospel, but I've done some calculations. So this hob is 7.2 kilowatt, which means it pulls 31.3 amp, whereas the old oven was 5 kilowatt, which was 21.7 amps. Now these are on that 32 amp radial, shared with the 13 amp oven. So if we add all that up, we'll see there's what looks like a problem at first. The, with the old 5 kilowatt hob and oven, that would be a maximum draw of 34.7 amps. And going to this new hob, we put our maximum draw up to 44.3 amp, which is obviously way more than this 32 amp circuit. However, we can use something called diversity. So this is in the wiring regulations. And the idea behind this is that yes, the hob can draw up to 7.2 kilowatt, and the oven can also draw, or the hob can draw what, 31.3 amps and the oven can draw up to 13 amps. But, are you ever going to have every hob ring on power boost with the oven maxed out, with like the grill and the oven on and the fan on, all 
where the thermostats are all powering all the things at the same time? Probably not. And if you did, it would only be for a very short period of time. And even if you did, you do have a circuit breaker to protect you. So in this case, diversity allows us to rate it down to a more reasonable factor. So in the wiring regulations, it states that I'm trying to do this off I know it, but I'm to try and put it into words. It states that you take the first 10 amps of the load as 10 amps. So in that case, we take 10 amps, and that gives leaves us left over with 34.3 amps. So of the, those remaining, that remaining current, we take 30% of that. And then we add on 5 amps additionally. Now that additional 5 amps is because of this isolator switch here. Because it has a socket in it, we add on an extra 5 amps to allow for that. And if we do that calculation, for the old setup, that comes out to 22.41 amps. And for the new setup, that comes to 25.29 amps. So both of those are totally well within the 32 amp limit of this circuit. And actually you can see once you apply diversity, the upgraded hob doesn't really change the amount that much. So that's definitely important to bear in mind though, because if you've got an older hob that's not particularly powerful, or you're upgrading from like a 13 amp induction hob to a proper hardwired one, you might need to worry about the circuit. Especially if you're going from say like a gas hob where you've got an electric supply to it and you think, oh that's electric for the, for the hob. But for a gas hob it's only designed for the igniter, it wouldn't run the hob. But in this case here, with this 32 amp circuit, when we apply diversity and get 25.29 amps for the hob and the oven, with everything connected over 6 mil twin and earth, which is more than capable of carrying that current, we're fine. So, what we now need to do is get the new hob connected up and installed. Okay, so we've hit a slight snag, and that is that the hob is slightly too big for the existing cutout. There's a couple of different issues. The first one is the hob has squared corners, whereas the old hob had rounded corners, and the corners here are also rounded. So I'll need to square these off. And the other issue is that while the width is absolutely fine, it's about a centimetre too short front to back, or the hole's about a centimetre too small front to back. The hob itself fits, but the issue is these screws. There's screws on the front, screws on the back, and those add up to about an additional centimetre, and with those it snags. So I've gone out and bought what's probably the world's worst jigsaw. It was just like, I need something cheap that I can get while in lockdown, so I can go to Argos in a supermarket and buy the one they have in stock. So it was 15 quid, it's probably going to be rubbish, but I don't really have much use for a jigsaw, so I just went and got a cheap one because I'm literally needing to do one cut with it and I'll probably not use it ever again, or I might use it like once a year. So what I need to do is I need to work out how that works, measure out here, square off these corners, and then cut about an additional centimetre here at the front. I decided to do it at the front rather than at the back because it would be easier to get into the front to try and cut it, and there's not as much space at the back. There's already more space here than there is here, so I'd rather take it off the front. So yeah, that's going to be fun. Time to go and get measuring and do that. So that's now cut and then that bit should just break off. There we go. There we go, that's now removed. Well, it's all mucky underneath and stuff that's gone under. But yeah, that's now removed. And what I wasn't thinking really is the amount of dust that's kicked up is ridiculous. I, wasn't, I was, knew it would kick up some dust, but not, not this much. Like literally every black surface in this room is covered. My foot's covered, the worktop's covered, the camera is like covered in dust, like just everything. So, and I'm just looking at the lights and I can see it floating in the air, so I'm going to have a lot of cleaning to do in here and probably going to continue cleaning for days because it'll just settle on things, but it's done. And yeah, don't buy a 15 quid jigsaw in Argos if you need it for anything important. I mean, it worked, but yeah, it was not the best. It did the job, but yeah, it wasn't very powerful, vibrated like mental, and I couldn't actually get a hoover to fix onto the dust attachment because it's not got a proper fixing for it. So I couldn't actually have it to have it connect to the Hoover to extract the dust, which is why there's now such a mess. But I mean, for this job it worked, because I didn't want to spend much money, I've not got much use for a jigsaw apart from this one project. And yeah, for 15 quid it did the job, but yeah. Not recommended if you need anything, need it for anything major. But yeah, that's holding a cut out. So what I'm going to do is go around and try and Hoover up everything as best I can, and then try and fit the hob in again, and hopefully it'll fit without needing much more adjustment.
Right, so I've cut the hole out bigger now. Now before we put the hob in, we need to put this foam seal around the outside. I suppose it's the same idea as what was on the old hob, but at least with this one, it, because the hob doesn't get hot, because it's, it's an induction hob, not an electric like element one, hopefully the, the foam won't get hot and degrade like on the old one, hopefully it won't become that sort of sticky mess. So we just stick this around the outside, and then we should be good to put it in the hole, assuming the hole's big enough for it. I suppose this just provides a sort of nicer sort of barrier between the surface of the worktop and the hobbit. I suppose the work worktop is slightly unstable, this will sort of dampen that, like absorb or you know, compensate for some of that. So just stick this down. Oh, making sure I can get it vaguely straight. I don't want this showing out from sides. This isn't cut size or anything, so you just have to sort of put it on and cut it yourself. That's fine. There we go, and cut that off there. Like that. And then just do the same for all the other sides. So that's the foam strip now installed around the perimeter of it. So now the moment of truth is will it fit in this hole, or do I have to do more sawing again? Because I really don't want to have to, because that was not a fun experience. Being very careful with this because I hit one corner of it, I'll risk breaking it. There we go. And we'll see if this actually fits. Much easier if there wasn't a camera in the way, but we'll do it for the video. There we go. So that goes in there, that goes in there, and support underneath. Excellent. There you go, that's perfectly installed. I mean, well, it's not wired in, but it's in there, and yeah, there's a little leeway in it, so sort of move it around to centre it, and that's now. Looks fairly centred. So what I need to do is I'll lift this out again and we'll do the electrical connection and then we'll be almost done. So now let's take a look at the electrical installation of this. So on the bottom there's this little access panel that you can pop off. It's just a screwdriver fit so you just basically lever it out like that. That opens up and comes off. And in here you'll see loads of terminals. Now this is quite common on these hobs because they're designed for different markets. In the UK we always use single phase supplies in domestic installations. But in other countries you have two phase, well you have three phase supplies and you can connect the two of the phases to this if you're on a three phase supply. And if you're on a, two, on a single phase supply like I am, you need to then install these little copper links that are bundled away down here, they're hard to get out, there we go. These little copper links that go between some of the terminals. So there's these two here, that one's stuck. It just pops out, there we go. And up here we have a wiring diagram. So we can ignore this one because that's for a three phase supply. But for a single phase supply here, you connect the earth, just straight to the earth obviously. You connect the neutral into the neutral into neutral 1 and then put a link across to neutral 2. I suppose you could do it the other way around as well, but yeah. You put it into neutral 1 and then put a link across. And then for the live, you bring it into live 1 and you put a link across to live 2. So that should be fairly easy to do. So, yeah, there's some screws there. Interestingly, they're all Torx heads. That's fine, I've got Torx screwdrivers. I suppose that's probably quite good to get decent torque to tighten it up rather than trying to use a Phillips. So I'll just go away and get a Torx screwdriver to go and do that. But yeah, that should be easy enough to do. And then there's also a cord grip here, so you can probably loosen that off and then run the flex under, well not the flex, the turn and earth under. So that loosens off. Like that. And yeah, that lifts up to allow the cable under. So I'll go and do that off camera because it'll just be a lot of me fiddling about trying to put wires in while reaching over a camera, so I'll do that off camera, then I'll come back. Okay, so that's the wiring now complete. We've connected them all in, so the earth connects there with a new bit of sleeving, because that old sleeving was all burnt up. Neutral goes into here with a little bus bar across, and then live goes into here with a little bus bar across. And then the outer sheath goes through the cable grip that holds it totally securely like that is not going anywhere. So, that's actually quite a nice design. You can get it really tight quite easily. So all you need to do now is clip the little cover over, so that just goes in there like that, and then clips down, and now we can drop it into the worktop. So just carefully lift it up and manoeuvre it. So we're now tethered to that cable, but that's fine. Just oops, we need to flip it the other way because I, I turned it so the cable would face me. Be very careful here. 
we're not having the best view, but there we go. That's now the right way around anyway. So, cable coming out the back. There, yep. So now just move it around and drop it in. Back there, there we go, get the towel out from underneath. And there we go. That's now dropped in. So shit, that's centered. Got measuring tape somewhere, here we go. Two and a half. Two and a half, yep, that's perfectly centered. So there we go. That's the hob now installed. So what we need to do now is get the oven back in and try it out. So there you go, that's now installed. Looks really good. Definitely looks a lot better than that old one. And as you see, I put the oven back in underneath as well, which looks really neat. And the one thing the manual stated that I thought I should mention is it says you need to have a 6 mil gap above the oven to allow ventilation from the, ho the hob to come out because this hob, being an induction hob, has built-in cooling fans and needs to be able to cool itself. You also need to have ventilation up from under the plinth here, so there is a gap there through, so that's fine. That goes up the back of the oven and then the air needs to be able to come out above the oven here. Now, it says you need to have a minimum of a 6 mil gap. I think I'm fine here. The oven's not straight, nothing in this flat is. So on this side, it's a 5 mil gap, on this side, it's like a, like a 9 mil gap. So yeah, on average, it's 6 it's six mil. So that's fine. And you can see the hob under there. So yeah, that's fine. It's just worth bearing in mind that you do want, you are meant to have a gap underneath and not have this sit directly against the surface because then you wouldn't have a ventilation gap for the hob to cool itself. But yeah, that's it installed. So now let's get the power switch back on and try it out. So the MCB at the consumer unit is back on. So let's turn this on and see if it works. This is obviously like genuinely the first time I've done it. So if it all goes bang, well, it'll make a good video. So turn the isolator on here. There you go, it's lit up. Yep, that's the hob, that's not the oven, so that's new. And that's now powered on. So what we can do is turn it on. So I've just got a pot of water we'll just chuck on just to test it with something. Put it on that ring there. I've briefly skimmed the manual on how to use it. There's a lot of functions that I've, I don't know yet, so I'll do that afterwards. I'll go and use it for a couple of days and I'll come back and do the review. But if we turn this on here, it's on, cool. And then if we press the up arrow on this one, it goes on to nine. There you go. And in theory, apparently if you hold down the up arrow, it says P and that should be power boost. Yep, that's working and the water is boiling. Well, it's not, but it's heating up rapidly. And having done the test previously with the old hob, maybe a few hours ago, it's a lot faster. So yeah, that is definitely working. So we've now got a working induction hob that's installed. It's working, not caught fire, I'm not dead. That's a good sign. So yeah, what I'll now do is I'll go away for a few days. I'll just use it normally. I'll just do normal cooking on it really. And I'll come back with my review, see if I find any weird issues with it. I'll try and use more a lot of the functions. I don't need a lot of the functions, but I'll try and use things like power boost. It's got this little pause function that's quite cool, so you can pause it, it remembers the settings, and you can start it up again. So if you need to run away, you can come back and start it from where you left off. We'll talk about that in the next bit. So I'll try and use, I'll try and use the timer, for example. Um, but yeah, it's, it's boiling water. It's a good start. So yeah, that's, really, that, that's gone really well. So yeah, I'm going to go away, test it out, actually cook something so I can eat, because it's probably about 11 at night now, and I've not eaten yet, because I've been too busy trying to get this working. But now I can go and eat. And I'll come back in a couple of days, and I'll give my review. Okay, so now I've got the hob installed and working, and it is absolutely brilliant. I really can't think of anything to fault this hall, like there's no problems I've had with it being a cheaper hob. It works brilliantly. Obviously there's only so much I can really talk about it, it's just a hob. But I've been using it fairly regularly, almost daily, for a good couple of weeks now since I put it in. And it's just been perfect, I've never had a problem with it. The controls are really responsive, which is good. There's no issues like the touch sensitivity not working, so you can turn it on there for example. That's on, just drop a demonstrator, so chuck a pot on there, for example. So I'll chuck it on there, because it's easier. And then just push that on there, push it onto nine, that's the top setting. Likewise, if you were to push the lower arrow, it starts on number four. So you can put, you can you can pick where to start, either at the top of the range, at the middle of the range, and it just makes it quicker to find a number you want. Then of course pressing the up arrow again will enable power boost. It'll run power boost for five minutes and then it'll turn it off. So it won't run continuously on power boost. But it's good to get water up to the boil. It'll get very close to a boiling point while on power boost and then automatically drop down to level 9. And because this is a full 7.2 kilowatt hob, we can chuck another pot on there, for example. 
put that onto 9 and also enable power boost. So we'd have power boost on multiple rings at a time. A lot of the lower powered hobs don't allow this, it'll only, only allow it on one ring, whereas this has no problem running power boost on multiple rings at the same time. The other thing is a timer, which I wasn't really thinking about it having, but it's actually really useful just having a really easy to use timer on the hop. So hit the button, put a time in, and that'll now count down. But what I discovered is this also has a per ring timer. So that's just an overall global timer that counts down and beeps at the end. But if you push the button again, that's editing the main timer. And now you can see it's put zero, zero, and it's got an LED in this corner. That represents this ring. So if I push it to that, for example, I can then set a timer for this specific ring. Push it again, it's now lighting up the top right hand corner, which is this ring, and set a timer for that ring. And now what that will do is then when it's finished, it'll now cycle through each timer to show how much time is remaining. But with a pair of ring timers, it will turn the ring off automatically. So the overall timer doesn't affect the hob, it just, it's, it's literally just a timer. But you can see here it's flashing the, the ring it represents, showing the time remaining. And once that gets to zero in its respective ring, it will turn that ring off, which could be quite useful. You know, if you're putting something onto boil and you want to go away and you're maybe you've got a guest around or you're talking to someone and you don't want to have to run immediately in to switch it off, you can just let it switch itself off and come back to it when you're ready. It's also got this pause function that's mentioned, so if you hit pause, that will turn the whole, all the rings off, but it will remember the settings they were on. So if you unpause it again, all the rings switch back onto the previous power levels. So if you've got a complicated thing with four rings on, all on different power levels, and you need to pause it to go away and answer the door or maybe take a phone call or something, you can quite easily pause it. So yeah, it actually works really, really well. The other thing it's got is this bridge mode function. So we'll take that pot off. As you can see, it's got pot detection. So when you lift it off, it puts this little symbol, which just indicates almost like a pot hovering above the thing, saying it's been removed. And after a while, the ring will turn itself off. And actually what you'll spot here is it's actually doing a countdown on this top right ring. It's now coming low on its timer. So when that timer runs, runs out, we'll see that ring will switch off. But yeah, you've got bridge mode here. So to do that, you simply hold down the two buttons on the left here. And it'll now put a little sort of shape on this one. And then that's zero. And now if you're to set... Yeah, and now if you set it, you need to set enter value quite quickly because it'll time out. But that's bridge mode. And now if you're set a power level, that's now set across both of these cooking zones. So you could use a larger pan across both of these and it would bridge them together. And now finally, as this zone timer is almost finishing, you'll see when that gets to zero, this top right ring will turn itself off. There you go. And it's turned itself off. And as you can see, it's got a hot like a hot um, ring detection, so if you, even if you turn the whole thing off, it will still indicate if a ring's too hot. Now here you can see how controllable this is. I've got a pot of water boiling, and you can see that updating the power level on the ring instantly impacts the water. So this means that when you're cooking, if it starts getting a bit too hot and like oil starts spitting or whatever, and you, you can turn it down and it will instantly take effect. And likewise, if it's not cooking quick enough, turn up the power level and it will instantly affect it. You don't have any issues with like turning it down and not actually cooling down quickly or needing more power and having to wait ages for it to heat up. It is just so much quicker and so much more responsive. And that is an absolute selling point of this. And it's such a difference I've noticed. Okay, so what you're now seeing is an attempt at a speed test between the two hobs. So we've got the new induction hob on the left and then we've got the old one on the right. And we're boiling, I think it's one and a half litres of water in it. And the, time, the interesting thing here is just to see which one, well, Obviously we know the induction one will, will boil first, but just seeing how much faster it is. So you see I've got a thermocouple in both, but it turns out the thermocouple doesn't work on an induction hob, it just glitches out and gives weird readings. But we can see the induction hob is already starting to bubble and getting very close to boiling already, whereas the conventional hob is barely even affecting the water at this point. And you can see there the water induction hob is now boiling, and that's now finished boiling at 5 minutes and 55 seconds in. Whereas you look at the old hob, there's just some steam there and we're maybe about 50, 60 degrees. So it's not even close yet. So you can just see the difference here. And this is boiling water, so you can imagine that how much faster the induction hob is, is just heating up so you can just cook something, let alone boiling water. So you see we're now at the 10 minute mark and it's starting to boil, it's maybe about 80 odd degrees, but we're still not boiling yet. Wait a little bit longer. 
I think the multimeter actually timed out there. I had to restart it because it was taking so long. And a little bit closer, but we're still not quite there yet. Multimeter being weird. Almost there. And we can see that we're finally boiling at 13 minutes and 56 seconds. We had to stop abruptly because the camera actually ran out of memory. It had been on that long. But you can just see there how much faster it is. That the new induction hob is over twice as fast at boiling water. So that's crazy, because if you look at the old one, it's 5 kilowatt versus 7.2 kilowatt. But just the efficiency of the induction hob means it is so much faster. Another benefit with this that I didn't really think about when I bought it is how easy it is to clean. Compared to like a, well, the old fashioned electric hob or a gas hob, or even a ceramic hob that gets physically hot, this doesn't have the issue with dirt with stuff getting burned onto it. With a hob where the rings are actually hot where there's flame, Stuff spills out of pots, touches it, and then burns on and becomes really hard to get off. With this, you get a little bit of heat obviously around the pot where the pot's sitting on it, but it's not nearly as hot as a ring, and the rest of the hob stays totally cool. So if stuff splatters out or gets all over it, it just wipes clean. Even just like standard kitchen cleaner or like a degreaser spray, just totally cleans it off. And then to remove all the streaks and fingerprints it inevitably gets, just using normal glass cleaner, really totally cleans it up. So yeah, this is a lot easier to keep clean. It is an absolute fingerprint magnet, like you just touch it and it just constantly gets covered in fingerprints. But it doesn't get dirt burned onto it, it's really easy to clean it off. And glass cleaner will take the fingerprints out if you've maybe got guests coming or something and you want it to look properly clean. So yeah, even being able to keep this thing clean is so much easier than the old one. So there you go, that is the hob working. And yeah, I actually can't fault this. I've used a couple of induction hobs, I've used this cheaper Hisense, and then my parents used to have a really high-end Neff one. And to be honest, I can't see a difference. I can't see a disadvantage to this one being much cheaper. Unless there's a long-term reliability issue with it, this thing works perfectly. And yeah, for about 200 quid, compared to that old thing I had, this thing is absolutely brilliant. So yeah, I very much re recommend this hob. So yeah, that's a slightly unusual video for me. It's not my usual topic. But I thought, well, I'm putting a new hob in. May as well do a DIY video on it, showing the installation, and then do a review of it. So yeah, extremely happy with this thing, and for £200 it seems like really good value. So yeah, thanks for watching.